not one but two World Series of Poker main event titles with that exact hand and ten deuce offsuit to protect Stalley. Right now. I didn't appreciate all that action. Because Doyle Brunson doing what he does best, winning in a poker game, something he's done for a long time. He was the first player to win over a million dollars in total prize money. There's something about some guys that can stick it out and uh, rise to the occasion that other, other guys can't. It's the same thing as what's been playing poker. Do it, big boy. <laughs> and, and that grin line is one of the prettiest sights in poker. I think I just love the game of poker. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. That's a quote by Hunter S. Thompson that was so important to Doyle that he gave it its own page at the beginning of his book, his life story, The Godfather of Poker. What a ride it was for Doyle Brunson. My name is Brian Ballsbaum, I'm uh, Doyle's longtime friend and agent. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you here today. Doyle grew up in Texas, was a terrific athlete. He was all state basketball, all state track. Spare time, he was all conference baseball. When Doyle was 18 years old, he ran a four minute, 18 second mile. Okay, to put it in perspective, the world record at that time was four minutes and one second. So Doyle was literally a world class athlete. He was such a good basketball player, the Lakers' top scout told Doyle's college coach that they would pick him with their first round pick in the NBA draft. But Doyle's dream of uh, becoming an NBA player would not come true. He took a summer job and tragedy struck. 2,000 pound stack of sheetrock fell and crushed his leg. His athletic dreams were over, so he had to adapt. So what did he do? He got his master's degree in education, took a job selling business machines for the Burroughs Corporation. And for seven months, Doyle went door to door, business to business, and our hero didn't sell a single machine. <laughs> but he did stumble on some poker games while calling on businesses. And he realized pretty quickly that he could make more money playing poker in a day than selling business machines for a whole month. Another quote from his book. Who knows if becoming a poker player was the master plan for my life? I can't rightly say. But once I found that backroom poker game, there was no turning back. A poker player was born. Now within a couple of years, Doyle is a full-blown Texas road gambler with his partner, Sailor Roberts and Amarillo Slim. Driving town to town, state to state, playing in the biggest poker games they can find anywhere. They dodge bandits, police, killers, robbers, hitmen, you name it. And those first couple of years, Doyle, he's the young, hot shot, up and comer. So he eventually ran into the man, best poker player in the world at the time, Johnny Moss. First time Doyle played with Johnny Moss, Doyle won $35,000. A year later, during a three day poker marathon, they played a big hand against each other. Doyle called this the turning point in his life. Board was King 7 8 Deuce Trey. Moss bets 4000 on the end. Doyle calls him with Jack-10, Jack-high. Moss had 5-6, Doyle won. And in his mind, in his peers' mind, that made Doyle a world-class player and catapulted him to being the best player in the world. Doyle was so good at poker that in 1963, he won money in 54 consecutive sessions. He was printing money playing poker. Moves to Vegas, as our friend Jack Benny will say, the only person ever, when Doyle came to play in a game, if it was a full ring game, everybody got up and left. They literally quit the game because they knew they couldn't beat Doyle. He was that good. Doyle continued his winning ways when a tournament poker started. He won 10 WSOP bracelets, a World Poker Tour title. And just a few years ago, 2018, he announced he was gonna retire from tournament poker. But that same day, he jumps in the 10K deuce to seven. The WSOP makes the final table in 143K. So 
But Doyle's career is unbelievable. I mean, he played great poker for roughly 65 years. Every game, every location possible. And the things he did off the felt certainly helped popularize poker, but I believe he'd want to be remembered as the person who set the standard that all future poker players should be measured. We're incredibly excited to have you here today. Appreciate you. Got some uh, amazing speakers, um, some heartfelt videos. And uh, with that, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen behind me. Well, I tell you what, Doyle is what everybody wants to be. He's loyal, he's forthright, there's no bull to him, he's honest, he obviously has, very confident, has the heart of a lion, but yet he's very empathetic, so he's just almost like, like out of a storybook, uh, almost too, too good to be true. Doyle is a link to past times and present times. He's seen the span of modern poker from sort of the early days and the, the birth of the World Series of Poker, where Doyle was one of the six original players and playing with Johnny Moss, the early legends, to the great players today. And Doyle just spans all this. He, he, he's American history, and that's what's so special about Doyle. There are people always asking Doyle about some new player that's doing really good and winning and all, and Doyle would always say the same thing. He said, well, I think he's pretty good, he says, but let's see how he does against the test of time. He was well-spoken, uh, played the game really in high level, and was able to do so for almost 60 years. How do you want to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as a poker player for my legacy, uh, to, because I played for so long at the top levels. I don't think anybody will ever do that again. Uh, the competition is a lot tougher now than it was then, but uh, I still managed to win. Uh, but I, I think uh, that's what I would like to be remembered for. I'm gonna tell you what, Doyle's had a great life. And, and all poker players have a great life because they just do what the hell they want to do. What, what can be better than if you don't want to get up and go uh, play, you don't have to. You, they're like kids at the schoolyard. You just go down there and start playing. In fact, Doyle, tell them about what you said about uh, everything is prefaced with play. Everything is prefaced with play. It's just, I think the way I close my book, I said, just, you're not just like a cloud floating up in the sky. You're just uh, the freedom that you've got. Yes. Do what you want. So, why could be a better life than that? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge the man who founded the World Series of Poker, Poker Hall of Famer and more importantly, Doyle's best friend for 60 years, uh, Mr. Jack Binion. It's my pleasure to now welcome to the uh, stage a Poker Hall of Famer, another one of Doyle's longtime friends, uh, Mr. Dewey Tomko. My name is Dewey Tonko, and me and Duel were both blessed by God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to become lifelong friends, business partners, poker partners, and golf partners. <coughs> that being said, the, uh, I'd like to tell you a few stories of uh, some of the things that uh, you, got, you guys don't know about Duel and his family. Duel and his family. <laughs> Doyle, uh, Louise, Pam, and Todd was a very, very religious family. Spent countless hours, time, energy, and money 
trying to bring people to the Lord and do good things for their community. He was very avid about trying to bring us poker players to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you a few of the stories. I could tell you all about his poker, his golf and gambling episodes, but I'm going to tell you a few things about what made Bill a uh, person who you guys don't know about. The first thing was years ago, 50 years ago, during the World Series of Poker, he decided to have uh, Bible studies. Is anybody here remembers that? Anybody old enough? Well, we got a couple old enough. Not good. Anyhow, with the permission of Jack Binion, in those days, you had to get permission from Jack to do anything. Nowadays, I don't know who it is. But uh, <laughs> Jack could, could never say no to Doyle. They had a relationship that was unbelievable. So anyhow, we started these poker studies. He would spend five to ten thousand dollars a day bringing these famous preachers uh, and give them the nicest hotel, fly them in to have Bible studies. Well, we started off with about ten or twenty. It grew to two or three hundred over the years. Uh, one of the things I remember about from six o'clock to seven o'clock every day, we would. Uh, uh, get up from the table to go to the Bible study. Come back at 7 o'clock, people screaming at us, where'd you go? All the losers were still sitting there waiting for us. And uh, <laughs> so um, this lasted for a pretty long time, for a couple of years, but eventually the World Series book where I grew us. We all couldn't leave at 6 o'clock in the morning, I mean 6 o'clock at night, uh, could go playing in tournaments and so. So now Gold decides the second adventure. He decides that uh, all the poor people in the world, in those days, everybody didn't have cable TV. In those days, you had little antennas like this and stuff like that to watch TV. So he decides he's going to uh, uh, get a Christian TV station in Mobile, Alabama. So he goes down there for uh, about five years devoting his time, energy to put this TV station on the, on the, on the air. He brings Chip into it, me into it, Dickie Carson, and Jack Binion into it. Lucky enough, he bought Jack Binion into it, but halfway through, we ran out of money. We had a borrow from Jack, and Jack never say no. And we did pay you back, Jack. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, so at the end result of that was that uh, he um, eventually gave it to the uh, 700 Club. So to this day, if you go to Mobile, Alabama, you can watch Channel 21 and Christian TV, which is a pretty good thing for somebody to do. Uh, the next one was very unique. He and, Do he and his wife Louise had a, uh, I don't know what they had, some kind of a percentage, but whatever he won and lost, he would give to Louise so that she could put uh, uh, money to charity or do good things for, for people. And one of them was she decided to go to Africa and all these four countries and put water wells in. And they cost about $1,500 a well. And she put hundreds and hundreds of them in all over these four countries. And she, most of them were named Brunson wells. But if you knew Doyle at the time, there's Binion wells out there, there's Billy Walters out there, Billy Baxter's, there's a Tomco well. He would name them, she would name them after his friends in honor of them. So to this day, there's somebody in Africa praying to this well this Tomko well, thank you, and I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> That's good. Anyhow, with that being said, and all the accomplishments we made, Dole Brunson, <coughs> the greatest poker player of all time, if he can spend his life doing things like that for the world, why can't we? So I think that's the message he'd like to stand. And I got one more thing I'd like to do to honor Dole, and this is very important to him. He was very adamant about this. He thought that anybody couldn't go to heaven if you didn't say the sinner's prayer. And he was adamant about that. So in honor of Doyle, I realize there's people out here that have different uh, religious uh, uh, beliefs and stuff. If you don't want to join me in this, it's okay. But I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer in, in honor of Doyle, and you can follow me. Lord Jesus, Somebody can say if you want to. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. So even in death, Dole is still bringing people to the Lord. That's a pretty good accomplishment. And Dole, 
get up there and have them get the cards ready, the poker tables. We're all going to be there soon. Just a quick thank you for Brian, Pat McMahon, Caesars, W. Sophie family. Thank you so much for all that you've done to make this happen. Uh, my condolences to Brunson family and to poker communities all over the world. We didn't lose a legend, we lost the legend. Uh, we've heard throughout our lives how players get lucky in certain games. I've said this before and it's worth repeating here. We hear one outer or ball bouncing at the right time for someone. What we don't hear is when the games get lucky. Games get lucky too. Baseball got lucky when Babe Ruth did his first home run. Boxing got lucky when Muhammad Ali knocked out his first opponent. Poker got lucky when Doyle Brunson dragged his first pot. Now we can go around these hallways, get pat on the back, congratulate one another for growing the game and the industry. And there have been some incredible minds with means that has helped that are in this room. Uh, but let's not forget how the foundation was set. And it was set with Doyle in a circle of friends. Uh, it's, I know it's hard to leave this not saying a couple of memories or two. Uh, the one that I'd like to share is what happened in one of the uh, high stakes poker moments behind the scenes. I think you'll enjoy it and it pretty much sums up Doyle's character. Uh, second season of high stakes, we were going to, Network had decided to uh, stage a boat on a platform that was about 10 feet high and uh, behind it, a green screen, and you know, they're, they're blowing wind at it and, and water at it. The whole idea was Photoshop this into the uh, uh, pretty wild, wavy ocean, making it look like that's what high stakes poker is when these guys are playing for all their money. So I had to walk Doyle to the back of the stage where this is all set up to go, except, as we know, Doyle was always on crutches. And uh, we decided he's not gonna go up the ladder, He's going to be sitting on the side, so we had a nice, comfortable uh, seat for him. And uh, he came and sat in the seat, and he said, okay, what are we doing here? I said, this is, this is the idea. And he goes, why is everybody sitting up there? I said, well, it's all good, it's all good. We're going to just Photoshop you right in the boat. It'll be very cool. That's all I had to say. He got up, he let go the crutches, he grabbed the ladder. I thought he was gonna pull everybody down from the boat. <laughs> and got himself up there and sat right in the middle with all the players. And that was truly his character. I can go on saying a lot of stories about Doyle. I mean, all of us, seriously, we can stand here for two weeks telling stories. I don't think Ty Stewart is gonna be okay postponing the main event for two weeks. I'm, I'm guessing not. Um, but there is a, a fellow that I had the privilege of working in 10 seasons of the high stakes with him the most fun I've ever had behind the scenes. And I leave the storytelling to him, Mr. Gabe Kaplan. Notice how slow all the people who really knew Doyle are gonna walk up. <laughs> I've been in this theater before. I worked here 50 years ago, working with Helen Reddy and Mac Davis and some of the big stars. I had a television show. Then I met Doyle Brunson. And the only people that know me now are the people that play poker. <laughs> Well, we're here to celebrate Doyle's life, his legacy, his wit, his charm, the big papa. Never anybody like him, 
there never will be anybody like him again. If you knew Doyle, you loved him. And if you knew him really well, you knew that there was another side to him. Not quite so lovable. And you saw that side, especially you were trying to make a golf match on the first tee. I'm not saying that Doyle was a tough bargainer, but if he was a hostage negotiator, there'd be a lot of dead people all over the world. <laughs> we had arguments about everything. One time, we used to talk about religion, politics. One time we were in one of the great theological centers of California, the Commerce Casino. <laughs> <laughs> and we bet $1,000, we would ask every dealer who came in the box, do you believe in evolution or creation? Now, this just shows you I couldn't win an argument with Doyle. Now, some of them said creation, some of them said evolution. We said, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. And then we were about pretty even. And then one dealer said, well, I kind of believe in both of them. Now, would you believe that Doyle won the money on that and I couldn't? <laughs> well, creation came before everything came, so if he believes in creation, he believes in that. And then, uh, we had a bet in 1981. We looked at the roster who was playing in the World Series of Poker. And there was about 25 guys from Texas and about 15 Jewish guys. <laughs> and I said, Doy, you put up $100 for every Texan and I'll put up $100 for every Jew. If a Texan wins, you get the money. If a Jew wins, I get the money. So you got it. Got down to the final two players were Stu Unger and Perry Green. <laughs> Both were Jewish. <laughs> so all came over, he paid me off, and he said, Gabe, you Jews won't even give a man a sweat. <laughs> There's a lot of people that come up here and speak. I mean, I've told this story before, but I'll tell you about the first time I met Doyle. I used to call him on high stakes poker, I used to call him Imhotep. Because when the Binion started the World Series of Poker, Doyle built the first pyramid by winning in 76 and 77. And everybody became aware of the World Series of Poker. And I became aware of it, and in 1978, I went down to the horseshoe, <clears throat> and everybody was really friendly. Uh, Jack Binion was there, he was a total gentleman to me, made me feel welcome. Eric Drake gave me as much credit as I wanted. <laughs> I had never played Holden before. <laughs> and then I met Doyle. And Doyle had just come out with Super Systems. And he said, Gabe, seeing you on TV, I want you to have my book. And he wrote a nice inscription in the book. May all your hands be winners. May the flop be with you, something like that. And he said, this book I'm selling for $100, but I want you to have it for free as my gift to you, as my opening gesture of friendship. He said, thank you very much. It was a great gesture. That free $100 book in the last 40 years has cost me $35 million. <laughs> I have to introduce our next speaker, who was a very close friend of Doyle, the guy who started the World Poker Tour, a legend. Everybody knows him. He's a great guy, Mr. Lyle Berman.
It's my understanding I'm the last speaker. And many, many years ago, we were opening a casino in Avoyles, Louisiana, and I was the last speaker. And we were going to open the casino at noon. At about 9 o'clock in the morning, the crowd started to gamble. And it was really hot, and, and they were really getting grumbly. And about seven or eight speakers spoke before me. Finally, I looked over the crowd and I said, you know, everything that's been said has been said, everything I'm going to say has already been said, let the games begin. And they all went into the casino. You're not all that lucky today. <laughs> My relationships with Doyle started in 1977, but he didn't know it. I bought a copy of his book, How I Made a Million Dollars Playing Poker. After reading it, it rekindled my interest in poker. In 1983, I was in Vegas, and I had just won $10,000 playing craps and decided to enter a $100 poker tournament with a total of 25 players. Although I didn't win or even came in the money, I enjoyed playing and losing the $100 more than I did winning at craps. When I told Doyle the story, he said without batting an eyelash, that's what we like, businessmen who enjoy losing. <laughs> Our relation lasted 46 years. I tell people that I've spent more waking hours with Doyle than with my two ex-wives combined. <laughs> When Doyle wrote his second book, he selected me to write the chapter on PLO, Pod Limit Omaha. When I asked Doyle how much I, how much I was gonna get paid, he said, there's fame and fortune. I'm already famous, so you can have the fame, I'll keep the fortune. <laughs> and that's what he paid all of us to write the chapters. <laughs> Throughout his life, he knew many famous people. One day I'm checking into the Commerce Club and right next to the check-in is a, a cafe. And there's Doyle sitting with three other older gentlemen. I went over there, I said hello, he introduced me to everybody and I went up to my room. That night we're down playing poker in the Commerce Club and I don't know how it got around but I said, you know, I really love Maverick. Um, and James Gardner, and I only wish I could meet him sometime. He says, meet him, I introduced him to you at lunch today. <laughs> I guess some of my observations aren't quite as good. I spent many hours with Doyle, both at the poker table and, and at the dinner table. Both at the poker table and I say, in, and at the, at the dinner table. He and Louise visited with me at my home in Cabo and the ranch in Telluride. And be it at the poker table or the dining room table, I always enjoyed his company. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm now supposed to introduce, there's going to be a short video. The World Poker Tour was born as a place for poker's biggest stars to shine. And from the onset, no one shined brighter than Doyle Brunson. It's a privilege to be playing with a guy. Definitely, without question, one of the best players ever to play. Welcome back to Bellagio on the World Poker Tour. We in 2002, as the inaugural season drew to a close, Doyle sat front and center at the first WPT Championship final table at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. He's all in. He's going all in with this. Doyle Brunson, the godfather of poker, is all on the line. What's it going to be? Alan Gehring wins over a million and a half dollar pot here and knocks out the Godfather in one blow. While well, the final table didn't result in victory for Doyle, the poker legend eventually found his way onto the WPT Champions Cup. And in second chair position, Texas Dolly Doyle Brunson. He's a member of the WPT Walk of Fame. He's all in. He is. He's gone all in here. Under the bright lights of Tinseltown, poker's legend of legends shine brightest by winning the WPT Legends of Poker at the Bicycle Casino in Los Angeles.
latter part of the next two decades, Doyle lent his star power to the WPT, and the WPT proudly showcased the godfather of poker on television broadcast to millions of poker fans around the world. Always pushing it all in. As everyone knows, Doyle Brunson is a legend in the world of poker. You gotta have a combination of, I guess, skill and luck. There's no substitute for experience. Nothing absolute about poker. You just kind of do what you feel like. At least that's the way I do it. I don't consider myself to be any kind of celebrity. You know, a poker player. Doyle may have played fewer tournaments over the last 10 years to spend more time at home with his beloved wife, Louise. The game always found a way to welcome him back. Doyle Brunson, the godfather of poker, the sharpest memory of any person on the planet at his age. Good move, Doyle. Wow. When he became an ambassador for WPT, Doyle also became an official member of the WPT family. In December, at the WPT World Championship, the very event that he flying the table 20 years earlier, Duell gave the poker world another unforgettable moment. As he made his way into the wind poker room, everyone stopped what they were doing and spontaneously stood in a moment of reverence and broke out in a robust round of applause to pay homage to one of the greatest poker players of all time. Doyle Brunson, a trailblazer, an icon, an ambassador, a poker superstar. Doyle, you were all of these things. But to the WPT, you will always be family. We join today with all of poker in saluting you and a life and legacy that will be remembered forever. Life is just an intricate blood, and when it stops, you're gone. So if you should do whatever that you enjoy, you know me, that's quite a poker. Not sure if you're aware, but poker history was made last night, or rather this morning. 5 a.m., Mr. Phil Helmuth Jr. won his 17th World Series of Poker Bracelet. I spoke with Phil this morning at 6 a.m. thinking he's probably going to go to sleep, but, you know, Phil, you're on the, on the docket to speak today. Can you make it happen? And he said, absolutely. I respect and love Doyle so much. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Please welcome Mr. Phil Helmuth. All right, here we go. Um, you know, to, to me, Doyle was like an oasis. And he sat there and he ruled the high stakes room at the Bellagio for ever since the Bellagio was opened. And you were always comfortable with him. Everybody loved him. He had an, an amazing, keen sense of humor. And I remember, um, he and I were in the north, northern England together, and uh, I was a little bit stressed out. And uh, and I saw him, and I went and I sat next down to Doyle, and we spent 45 minutes just sitting next to each other. And there was a comfort <coughs> there. You know, we talked 15 minutes. We were just comfortable. And I think everybody in the poker world it was comfortable with Doyle. And uh, he just... People just wanted to be with him. Style, uh, honesty, honesty is top of the list when you're a poker player. When you can trust somebody, when you're playing high stakes poker and you know that that guy's gonna give you a fair shake, that was Doyle. And uh, so, you know, like an oasis, you, you just wanted to be with him, everybody wanted to be with him. Um, let me switch tactics here and I have a, a talk about uh, Doyle bluffing me. This man, <clears throat> bluffed me in the 80s. This man bluffed me in the 90s. This man bluffed me in the 2000s. Now in the 2000s, it was recorded. Okay, so I got to see all these freaking bluffs that he put on me because it was on poker after dark. I'd have a 10, it would be 10 deuce deuce. He'd have nine high and move in. I just fold, you win duel, you win duel. So when I, when I, when I found out I was filming with him in December, 
I said, this guy's not going to bluff me. No way is he going to bluff me. I'm going to earn his respect today. And, uh, well, they showed the hand where um, I had ace, queen, I raised. This is for the poker players. It came ace, ten, eight. They just showed the hand briefly on the screen. And uh, Doyle called. And uh, on the river, he moved in for $23,000. And I sat there hemming and hawing and hemming and hawing. And this man at age 89 bluffed me one more time. Well done, Doyle. Um, I'll miss you. And I'm not sure I'll miss being bluffed by you. The term legend, right? That's thrown around, as far as I'm concerned, rather loosely. You know, there are a lot of legends in the world, in the world of poker. There's only one, like the legend, and that's you know Doyle Brunson. And for someone like Doyle to be able to do it, you know, decade after decade, and um, continue to be like not just playing in the biggest games, but still winning, is something that I think we can all admire and aspire to do. And you know, when you think of Poker Hall of Fame, I think one of the one of the key aspects of that, you know, that Doyle always stuck to, and I think Dewey mentioned this, was just standing the test of time. And if he's the barometer, then nobody ever will, because it's just remarkable. I mean, for me personally, you know, I look at the poker world that we have now, and I think back to like when I was a teenager starting to play poker, and wanting to make my parents proud of what I do. And Doyle made that possible. Doyle came from a different different world. You know, most poker players back then came from CD backgrounds or whatever, or uneducated, as Doyle said. And, you know, Doyle was highly educated. And, you know, we think about what's available today to learn how to play poker, solvers, data. This man was the solver. Like, he took a pen and paper and dealt out hands and figured out, like, ace tens is a favorite over ace king, manually. You know, I, I, imagine, I just, I wonder sometimes, like, the new generation or the younger kids, like, if they truly, really can sort of appreciate how awesome and how important Doyle was to the growth of the game. I mean, he wrote the book, Super System, which is like the poker bible, if you will. And, you know, Phil mentioned, you know, him playing at 89. I played with him last year. And we played an high stakes poker show. Um, and I've been bluffed by Doyle as well. But I remember um, thinking to myself, He's getting better. He's getting better. Like I thought of the Doyle from eight, ten years ago, and I was playing. He was playing some pots, and um, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, and he was doing things that I'd never seen before. Like he had new tricks up his sleeve, and I've always like admired the fact that like he's had many sidekicks throughout his life. You know, it was Chip and Doyle, and you know he he, he traveled the, the Texas Road Games back when he first started, and then you know it progressed to even the younger generation. And I think. It's, I'm not going to steal his quote, but the beautiful one about, you know, we don't get old because we stop playing, we get old. Or, you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, you, you know the quote. Um, but I just, just for me, my favorite stories are the ones with Phil Ivey, right? Because you think of where Doyle came from, you know, the Texas road gambler. And then you see this young kid from, you know, the streets of Atlantic City, and they're sitting at the same table, and they're going at each other like... Just killers, you know, and I, you, Gabe talked about the golf thing and the negotiating, and I've seen that firsthand. It was probably one of the more fun experiences ever, playing, going to Shadow Creek. We were supposed to play a 10.30 tee off. And, um, you know, we do the negotiation thing. E-Dog, they offer him four side. He's like, nope, I need four and a half, whatever. That takes about three minutes, and Eric says, okay, whatever you say. Phil and Doyle, we check in with him at 11.30 because we're still arguing over half a shot. It's 12.30, it's 1.30, about 3.30, we decide we're not going to be playing today because they just would not give an inch. Um, and I think there was some, like, just deep admiration and respect that Doyle had for the younger generation. He was never one to sort of look down on them. He always had that respect, and I think that's what contributed to his longevity and his ability to adapt. 
to whatever poker brought to you. And I, it's been said many times, but I don't think we'll ever see another um, legend like Doyle Brunson. Uh, and I'll miss, you know, playing with him in Bobby's room and the moaning about how he's never won a sports bet in his entire life, you know? But um, I'm also gonna miss that big smile. Uh, I believe we have a video here that sort of delves into a little bit about who Doyle Brunson was, the man. The funniest thing, you, I think, is when you, she always says you were winking across the table at her, you know, and then you knew you could, you were back in the drugstore the next day asking her out. I knew that she was the one I wanted, that person that I met her. Her personality? I know she was really pretty, but. She, yeah, she, she has got a great personality. She just, uh, she never, never met a stranger. She just uh, talk your ear off. But she's so sweet. Like even now, how she just laughs and has a good time with everyone. She never has a bad day. She I mean she comes. She's cheerful all the way home every day. I, so sweet. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Well, to be a Christian in the poker world, I learned right quick you can't cram religion down somebody's throat. So I stopped trying to do that. I just waited, you know, if anybody uh, showed any interest or wanted to talk about it, I would talk to them about it. But like I say, I learned right right quick, you can't go up to people and start, uh, poker players especially, and start talking about religion because they say, I don't want to hear it. So you just have to wait until somebody uh, shows some interest and then you, you try to explain it to them. She started, we started having Bible studies at my house and she ran them, the marvelous spells for everybody and everything. All, all the poker players were coming and some of the dangerous things happened from that Bible study. I mean, a lot of guys like Danny Robinson was completely hooked on drugs. A guy named Harry Thomas was out of his mind on cocaine and they got delivered some way. I, don't ask me how. I don't try to uh, force that on people, but they did, and it, it was just amazing. Everything, I, I mean, everybody, nobody knew anything about praying or anything, but, but my wife did. And uh, everything we prayed for came true. It was just incredible. So I got to study and check in by myself, started uh, reading the Bible, and so we, we finally became Christians. That, that was the beginning of everything. I, I've seen poker games break up with like a million dollars on the table and the players go to the, to the Bible study. So, I mean, that, that was incredible. That was rewarding that uh, they would do that. Please welcome Todd Brunson. people here. My dad would be really happy to see you all. And you'll have to bear with me. I wasn't asked to speak till last night. Brian did a great job here. I got to thank him especially. Yeah, it's, that's true. So the first thing I thought is I would thank all of you, so thank you all. And then I thought I would say something nice about all the speakers who spoke. But then I started thinking, about Daniel busted me the last two tournaments that I played in. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Do you know what just happened? Did you just, just no compassion? <laughs> That's okay, kid poker. I don't know why you still call yourself that. You're like almost as old as my dad was. <laughs> And Phil Helmuth, he just couldn't stand that my dad was going to have this big event just for him. <laughs> I'm not going to say he's egomaniac, but he had to go win a bracelet three hours before the event. <laughs> and 
And I actually requested to speak after Dewey, because Dewey's not known to be the greatest speaker. <laughs> but he knocked it out of the park too, so. So anyway, like I said, my dad would be very happy to see all, all of you here today. So the, the poker world is his second family. Um, he probably liked you guys more than his first family. <laughs> When I was a little boy, we lived in Texas, and my mom and I would drive him to the airport to go play poker to you know, fly to Vegas. And I literally asked my mom, I said, Mommy, why does Daddy live at the airport? <laughs> and so we finally moved to Vegas, and I was just slightly older than, younger than my son here. Uh, I, was four, I turned four years old on the road. We actually stopped and had a party at Shakey's Pizza. If, I'm sure the young people here don't remember that place, but it used to be a big place. So we got here, and um, after a while, I guess my mother kind of had enough of me. It's hard to believe that somebody wouldn't want to be around me 24 hours a day. But... So she would send me out with my father for the day. Uh, my, it was. It was already mentioned about the, the golf negotiations. And that's how his day would begin. He would wake up and get on the phone, and that phone call might be 15 minutes, it might be three hours, but he would find a golf game and then off we would go. And we would play, well he would play, I would run around and chase ducks or fish or something. And it, it now that I'm older, it really amazes me, is right before the World Series, I had a, my wife and I were going to, supposed to go to dinner with Matt Savage and his wife, Marianne. And Matt called me up almost literally in tears saying that, oh, I, my feet hurt, I just, I, I played 18 holes of golf, and, and, and then an emergency nine, I, I can't go, I'm sorry. In contrast, my dad would go regularly play three rounds, 54 holes. And keep in mind, he did this up until he was, I don't know, 65. And a lot of that time he weighed 400, 450 pounds. And he did that in the Las Vegas heat, 120 degrees. And then instead of coming home, going to sleep, we would go straight to the Horseshoe or the Dunes or wherever that might be. And he'd play poker until three in the morning. He would send me home with some flunky or something, usually Dewey. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then he would get up at nine o'clock the next day and do it again. That was his whole life. Poker, golf. He did, never took a break, never took a vacation. It was truly amazing. Um, it, was, it was pretty cool for me too because Jack Binion, when he, took, when he would take me, Jack would give me the run of the horseshoe. Uh, security guards didn't like that very much. Uh, whenever one of them would catch me, and that wasn't easy to do, I could just drop Jack's name and all was forgiven whatever I had done. Jack, we all know how lucky Jack is, he's had a great life. He probably doesn't know quite how lucky he is though. Uh, my father was known as a godfather of poker, but Although we're not Catholic, Jack was my unofficial godfather. If uh, my mother had died, I was going to be raised by Jack Binion. There was one more lottery ticket you hit that the, my dad lasted this long. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have a lot of uh, big wicks from WPT here. GG Poker, I'd like to thank them for making this possible, it's very nice. Give them a round of applause, feel free. And that brings me to my last story. It's one that most people don't know. And that's that my dad used to own a poker site, online poker site. And they're all sitting there saying, yeah, we all know about Doyle's Room. No, I'm not talking about Doyle's Room. I'm talking about Highlands, yeah, thank you. Highland Pokers. It was right after Party Poker, or not Party Poker, Paradise and Planet Poker. 
And much like another poker site, which I won't mention here, I don't want to embarrass a few people here, but there was a little commingling of the funds with the players' deposits. And when the door shut, there was no money to pay the investors. So I think my dad owned 40% of the site or something, but he took 100% of the responsibility and paid back all the investors some, you know, seven figures that he paid. Considering how long ago that was, that was a pretty big chunk of money. And it's something he never talked about, never took credit for, but you stop and think about that. He wasn't responsible. His name wasn't on that side. That was truly an amazing thing, in my opinion, that he did. I think that's about all I have to say. But once again, thanks to Brian for doing all this. Thanks for all of you for coming. Uh, he would have been tickled pink to see this turnout, and this, uh, how nice everything was, how great everyone spoke, especially Dewey. <laughs> And thank you once again. Thanks, One more round of applause for Todd and the entire West family and friends. When you came today, I hope you had a chance to get one of those deck of cards. There's 52 cards. Every card has a doyalism on the back. There are 26 cards of 10. There are 26 deuces. In the spirit of 10 deuce, consulted with the family, and we have the poker world here pretty well represented. Would you all agree this is a quorum of the poker world? I'd like to propose that October 2nd, the 10th month, the second day, is hereby known as Doyle Bronson Day, moving forward. You know, okay with it, we'll move to a vote. Can I get a second? One second. All in favor say aye. 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 Yeah, okay. We got, we got Doyle Brunson Day, October 2nd. What are we going to do on Doyle Brunson Day? I think we celebrate poker. I think we play poker, celebrate the man and you know, just honor his life every year on October 2nd. So that's absolutely fantastic. So for the past uh, six months prior to Doyle, for the past six months prior to Doyle's passing, I had this unbelievable honor. Somehow I talked him into uh, recording his auto autobiography for, as, for an audio book um, and he said, of course, I'll do it with you. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, he doesn't understand. This is an 18 hour book, but he did. And we set up a studio in his house and he started reading it. And I got to sit next to him with the production guys and hear him laugh at those stories and even shed some tears in the, tar in the hard parts. And it was something that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. And I think in closing today, as we finish our celebration for Doyle's amazing life, the best way to do that is for all of you to share what I shared and to hear directly from Doyle one last time. I've come to realize that life experiences are ours to keep and cherish. Permanent gifts like diamonds that sparkle in your head. When I journey back to my college years at Hardin Simmons, it's as if I can remember it all. The games, the glory, the shots I made, the shots I missed. It all plays out again, brand new, on a basketball court in my mind. I feel you own your experiences. They are yours to keep. What you do now will become a permanent part of you. The good things and the bad things. Think about that as you go through life. I can't tell you that the cards you're dealt will be the ones you want, but whatever they turn out to be, play them wisely and honestly and with passion and pleasure. That's the secret. It's hard to believe it's been a half of a century since Louis and I started our life together in Texas. It seems like yesterday that Todd, Pam, and Cheryl were children. Now they're grown and I'm blessed that they have turned out so well. It's been a real adventure and all the experiences, good and bad, blend into incredible remembrances. I think back on why I embraced poker in the first place. It was always challenging, exciting, and rewarding. An ongoing education and emotional adventure that continues to this day. 
And I am thankful that I chose my own path, or at least followed the path chosen for me and embraced the opportunities that came my way. I still play poker because it energizes me and keeps me thinking young. Sure, the money is part of my motivation to play poker, but there's also the adrenaline rush you get when that last card is turned over, a slight hesitation while your brain takes in all the information, and the thrill of victory if the pot is pushed your way. But I chose the profession of poker for another reason. I play poker because of the freedom. I'm my own boss, set my own hours, choose my own friends, and select my own adversaries. I feel as free as a fluffy white cloud floating in a bright blue sky. That's the most beautiful part of being a gambler, the freedom and the memories. Thank <laughs> you.